later in the week or maybe some other time during the month. We're glad you, you joined us. This message today is going to be very significant in your life. So I pray you just set everything aside and focus on what God is about to share. We also thank everyone who's joined us in person today. I believe God has something special that he wants to put into your hearts. How many of you remember just a couple weeks ago was Pentecost Sunday, right? And then the week before that was Ryan Carp with Chosen People. And he shared with us, remember, the Jewish perspective of Pentecost. And this next slide will remind you what we talked about, right? We talked about the feast. And, and Ryan did a great job, didn't he, of explaining to us how all the dots connect from Genesis all the way to Revelation. He talked about these feasts that have been celebrated for centuries, thousands of years, and how they are a shadow of what we're experiencing even today. We talked about the Feast of Passover. That's when Jesus presented himself, right? All those years they had the Passover looking to the day when the perfect sacrifice would come, when the Messiah would come. Wow, it happened. And on Passover, Jesus presented himself as the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. That is our moment of salvation. When Jesus was taken and crucified and he died and he was buried and then he rose again. Amen? Wow, we're getting to live in that reality. But then the second feast, that's the one we've circled because that's the feast we're living in right now. It's the feast of Pentecost. I want you to know that word is not a denomination. It's an experience. It's when the Holy Spirit fell upon the church and she was birthed in great power. Amen? The, the Pentecost, the word penna means 50. 50 days after Passover, Pentecost came and the church was born. It is, the har it is a festival of harvest. So what's that mean? We are living in the day of harvest. I'm living in the day of harvest. And I'm sure glad God chose for me to be in this time. How about you? You could have been born any time, but you're born in this time. You are living the day of harvest. We, this is our season of Pentecost. And then, of course, the Feast of Tabernacle, it's coming. Jesus is going to come again. How many believe that? But until that happens, we're living in the harvest. We're living in the time of Pentecost. And that's why Jesus said in John 16, 7, he looked at his disciples. I don't know if he said, hey, brothers. I don't know if he said, called them friends. Or, but he looked right at them. I don't know if they were sitting around the campfire or what. And Jesus said to them, I'm leaving. And they said, Lord, no, 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 no. And Jesus says these words. Listen, brothers, it's to your benefit that I go. If I don't go, the advocate won't come. But if I go, I will send him to you. You think they understood those words? No. <laughs> but we understand him, don't we? Jesus, he, he was connecting all the dots of the past. Did you know that everything, everything that transpired up to that moment was pointing to the day in which you and I are living? It's paramount that we understand the season, this season of Pentecost. It's important we understand the season that we're living in and the reason why Jesus was so emphatic about his leaving and the Holy Spirit coming. In fact, in the Greek, it's a very forceful tone that he had to the disciples. Guys, listen, I know you want me to stay, but I got to go. I got to go, and you're going to be glad because what's going to happen after I go, the advocate, the Holy Spirit's coming, and it's going to have a great impact upon you and people who will believe later, you and me right here in Wichita, Kansas. I have a question for you this morning. It's a what if question. What if Pentecost had never happened? What if it stopped with the Passover? I'll tell you what, the cross without Pentecost would have left every follower of Jesus saved, sins forgiven, but they would have been orphans and powerless to carry out the Great Commission. You don't believe me? Just look at the 50 days. If you want to know what it had been like, look at the 50 days. Jesus has been buried. Jesus rose again, and wow, the church just took right off, didn't it? No. They hid behind locked doors, didn't they? They were running for their lives. You know what happened in 50 days? Nothing happened in 
50 days. But all oh, then Pentecost came. Have you ever wondered why this topic is so controversial in the church? Because some of you, when I said we were going to talk on the Holy Spirit this summer, you tightened up just a little bit, didn't you? Why? Because you, ha- you have experiences in your past, right? Some positive, some negative maybe. But why does the church have such a struggle here with this doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity? Why is it so difficult for us? Why does it divide people? I'll tell you why. Because Satan knows how important it is. See, you've got to understand he was present on the day of Pentecost. He saw what happened. I don't know what you believe about the devil, but I can tell you this, he doesn't know the future. Satan doesn't know the future. If he knew the future, why would he have moved on Judas's heart to sell out Jesus so he'd go to the cross? Don't you wish he could have a, a do-over on that one? Oh man, I thought this was going to... Sh- I thought this was going to silence the church. I thought this was going to drive a stake in her heart. And what did I do? I ended up exploding this thing because of that, because of that sacrifice. Now, salvation came to us. Our sins are forgiven. Because we believe and put our faith in Christ, we are now the sons and daughters of the living God. Isn't that awesome? Amen. But it's not enough. See, Satan was there that day, and he saw something happen that he couldn't imagine. He saw the equation like he never saw it before. He saw this equation, 120 plus the Holy Spirit plus 24 hours equals what? 3,000 converts. He will never forget that. And he registered ding, ding at that very moment. This Holy Spirit thing is dangerous because When the Holy Spirit came, it was a game changer for the church. And that was the only way that the Great Commission would ever be fulfilled. Now, I'd like to spend this summer just reflecting a little bit on the purposes and the the role of the Holy Spirit in our daily lives and in our ministry. But I want you to relax, okay? Don't tighten up on me. Uh, Don't tense up. Here's what I would like you to do as we start this summer. I would like you to lay aside all your experiences, whether they're positive or negative. I'm I'm not asking you to jettison them. I just say, would you set them aside for a moment? Set aside all your preconceived ideas. And you, you may be like me. Maybe you've been walking this thing for a while. Well, some people even call me a Pentecostal. Maybe you've been, I've seen it all, man. I've I've been from one extreme to the other. Maybe that's you. I'm going to ask you to do something this summer. I want you to lay aside all of that for a short time. And with an open heart, take a fresh look. Because that's what God's speaking to my heart right now. Joe, I need you to take a fresh look. I don't want you to depend on the past experiences. I want to do something right now today in your life. Jesus was emphatic about this, and we should be too, because he knew the power of the Holy Spirit and what it would mean. Here's our problem today. We have complicated this thing. We have made it so hard and so difficult. We've muddied the waters. I believe this summer God wants to clear the waters for you and let you have a fresh look, a positive look, And that you're going to be excited about what God wants to do in your life as a follower of Jesus. Now we're going to begin our journey with the Apostle Paul's exhortation to the early church in the book of Galatians. Just full of of discussions about the Holy Spirit. But he challenged the church in chapter 5. And this is where we get the title of our message today. He challenged them, if you're going to live in the Spirit, I want you to walk in the Spirit. This is our series on living the resurrected life, and we're just going to start here today, and what did Paul mean when he said that? In the New King James, it says it this way, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Is it possible to live in the Spirit and not walk in the Spirit? Yes, it is. It's possible to be a born-again believer. That means you're alive in the Spirit. I'm going to show you that in Scripture. You can be alive in the spirit, but not walk in a day. Walking means just every day the Holy Spirit is part of your life. The NLT says it best. Listen to this. I like the way way it presents the scripture. Since we are living by the spirit, 
Let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Now, that's it right there. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm looking for in my life. I want, this, this Holy Spirit thing is not just for this church service. It's not just so you can rise to the top of the heap and people think you're hot stuff and you're spiritual. and you. No, no, no. We're talking about something that will affect your daily life. That's why he says walking. There's another place in Corinthians Paul talked about running the race. He didn't say that here. We're not running. We're not sprinting. He's talking about walking putting one step in front of the other. See, I believe, church, you can speak in tongues and not walk in the Spirit. You can have the gifts operating, but you're not walking in the Spirit. We're talking about a daily dependence upon the Holy Spirit. And this morning, just in the little time we have, I want you to take out your insert. We're going to look at three ways that we can position ourselves to walk in the Spirit. How many would like to do what Paul said? You, I, I want that in my life. Say, well, the preacher, he's got to walk in the Spirit. I mean, he's the preacher, right? You all need to walk in the Spirit. You all need to. I want to challenge you to open your heart up to a fresh look at what this means. Are you ready for the first step? I found this step. Don't you like this foot? I found that. I love it. Do you see? What do you see in that picture? You see a heart? You see a heart in there? Yeah. You see a foot? Yeah. The heart, the love of Jesus, the... the constrains us and motivates us and then you see the Holy Spirit power all that together in my feet and this summer we're going to learn how to walk in the spirit okay here's the first one this is where you got to start first step first step believe and receive believe and receive this is where it all starts right here what do you believe what are you willing to receive now I want you to change something it's got Ezekiel 37 it's really Ezekiel 36 so change that in your notes if you already wrote that down change it to Ezekiel 36 this is great I want you to understand something you're living in the greatest time ever in fact many people throughout the entire book of the Old Testament they dreamed about the day you're living in they look to this day listen to the prophet he said speaking for God to the children of Israel he said I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. Now I'm reading from the, the New Living Translation, unless I tell you otherwise. He, he, I like the way he puts it that, hey, listen, you're going to get a new heart when I'm done with you. You're going to have a new spirit in you, not just on you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart, and I will give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. They knew about the Holy Spirit. They knew about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They knew the Holy Spirit came and rested on people. But now the prophet's saying, hey, a day is coming when the Holy Spirit's going to be in you. And he's going to give you power to walk in my statutes. They dreamed about the day you're living in. They would trade places with you in a moment. Do you understand that? I believe God wants to restore that reality to you so you realize you've been chosen. You've been chosen. We, we said it to the graduates, right? God knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He knew you'd be here in Wichita, Kansas today. He knew you'd be part of this church. He has positioned you for the work. And he has chosen us to live in the time of harvest in Pentecost, in the time of the ministry of the church, for what purpose? But to reach the world with the gospel message. And if Pentecost had never happened, I can tell you we'd be stuck. But we're not stuck. And I want you to believe it. And I want you to receive it today. Galatians 3, 2 through 5. Listen carefully. Paul says, let me ask you one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not, he said. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your new life in the spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? I thought Ryan said it best, right? We can't even keep two commandments. How are we going to, we couldn't keep 10 commandments. How are we going to keep 300? Have you come to the reality? You can't. You can't do it. I can't do it. You can't do it. But the Holy Spirit in you can do what you cannot do on your own. He said, have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again. Does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It is because you believe the message you heard from Christ. I have a hard time in the church world sometimes, and I've been guilty. We compartmentalize the church, especially when it comes to the Holy Spirit. 
We have the haves and we have the have-nots. I don't believe that's how God sees it at all. Romans 8, 9 through 11. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And listen, and remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. You can't even come to Christ without the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that? It's the Holy Spirit who draws you. I remember Major Forberg's living room. I remember his coffee table. I remember kneeling there and asking Jesus to come into my heart. But I want you to know, it was the Holy Spirit who drew me to that place. He used that man, but it was the Holy Spirit setting me up all those many years. And my mom said the more she prayed, the worse things got. But the Holy Spirit wasn't concerned because he was drawing, he was working, he was positioning. Because you can't even come to Jesus without the Holy Spirit. Verse 10, and Christ lives within you, so even now your body will die because of sin, but the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. That's why Jesus said, I'll always be with you. How? The Holy Spirit's coming. He won't say anything unless he hears me say it. He's going to glorify me. He's going to teach you about me. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Now that's a, that's a game changer, right? How many of you would like to have been present at the resurrection? Have you ever even said, man, Lord, oh, boy, I'd love to go back there and just be there. I'd like to go back to some of the Old Testament times. No, no, they want to trade places with you because you're living in this day. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. I want you to believe it. But more important, I want you to receive it. And just as God raised Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. Many of you have seen this illustration before, but I think it helps us understand this whole idea of the spirit in our life and somehow how, how this all works. You know, we get saved, the Holy Spirit's present, and then how, do, how does he expand on that? Well, I'm going to use, oh, I brought me a pitcher of milk here. And these are three types of people, all right? So we're going to fill these glasses up. This is ice cold. Anybody here like milk? Huh? Some of you? There, there's the three. All right? Now I want you to think about this for a minute. This is you before you ever came to Jesus. But according to Romans 8, when you came to Christ, it was a work of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to offend the Holy Spirit by comparing him to Hershey's chocolate, but uh, I like Hershey's chocolate. When you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit drew you and connected you to himself. And according to Romans 8, that Holy Spirit lives inside of you. He lives inside of you. But I want to show you what happens It's one thing to be saved. It's one thing to recognize the Holy Spirit in your life. But here's what God wants to do with you. And this is how we end up walking in the Spirit. He wants to stir you up. What's the difference between these two? It has just as much chocolate in it as this one. But when you stir it up, It's taking every ounce of strength I have not to drink this. (laughs) Because I know some of you are wanting it right now, and I'm on low carb. I can't have this, okay? But this kicks it up a notch, doesn't it? This is what God is doing. It's not a question of the haves or have-nots. It's allowing the Holy Spirit to take control of your life. Not just the big things, but the little things too. And I think that's what... Paul's talking about, and NLT said it best, that he might have control of our whole lives. Many have the Holy Spirit, but they're not making access. They're not not taking advantage of that, and God's coming. And you can call it whatever you want. I don't care what you call it. You can call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You put any label on it you want. You just need a fresh look at this. God wants you to receive. Now, you say, yeah, do people have to lay their hands on you to do that? Yeah, that happened in Scripture. Yeah, in fact, Paul and Timothy say stirred it up by the laying on of hands, but there were times no one touched anybody. 
I can remember a prayer meeting right here not long ago, and there was a lady sitting in this chair right here. We weren't even talking about the Holy Spirit. We weren't even, we were on something else, and the Holy Spirit fell on her. You remember that, Steve? And she, you can see it, she just began to pray in the Spirit. I'm thinking, not now, not now. We haven't, it's not time for that now. Oh, Yes, it is. See, the Holy Spirit's wanting to take such control of your life right now. I want you to get a hold of this because this will change everything. This will change your marriage. This will change your relationships with your children. This will change the workplace for you when you begin to walk in the Spirit and He has total control of your life. You ready for number two? You want to position yourself? First, you got to believe. You got to receive. And I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm believing this summer. That's where you're going to be. But then secondly, after you believe, after you've received, this is just something very practical I want you to understand. You need to start every day with praise and prayer. See, you can have the Holy Spirit in your life, but you've got to position yourself. You've got to start your day with prayer and praise. Remember where we left off on Pentecost Sunday, the last scripture. Do you remember what it was? It was Ephesians, wasn't it? Five. Let me read it to you again just to refresh your memory. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Now let me stop and I got a lot of responses from something I said. And you knew it was coming, didn't you? I, I asked, is it okay for Christians to drink? And I said, yes, it is. L let me rephrase that, okay? Because I know we got teetotalers here. We got, you know, my wife's never even touched her lip to an alcoholic beverage, okay? But I believe the question of is it right or wrong is the wrong question. And, and, I want, I want to correct that for you, okay? Here's the right question. It's not, can I drink or can I not drink? Paul said this, all things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Not all things build up, and I will be mastered by none. That is the question you need to ask before you decide to take that path. Will this edify? Will this profit me? Will this master me? If it does, what's the answer to your question? All right, so I don't want to reduce it to yes or no. I would hope the spirit in you would lead you in this question today, okay? And it could be anything, anything. But the reason Paul wrote that, and I sometimes wish he kind of left it out, you know, why didn't you just leave that out and just say be filled with the Holy Spirit? Why did you have to talk about being drunk? Well, there's a reason, remember? The believers in Ephesus, drunkenness was part of their worship in the temple of the goddess Diana. So they understood this. And, and it, everybody understood. And, and so Paul captured that moment and he said, listen, don't be drunk with wine. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. What is the connection here? He's saying, I want you to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit like you are when you're under the influence of alcohol. And that alcohol controls the way you speak, the way you walk, the way you talk. I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit that's even beyond that experience. I want you, every crevice of you, to be touched by the work of the Holy Spirit. Now look what he says here. This is why I think, this is very practical. If you want to walk in the Spirit every day, I'm not asking you if you speak in tongues. I'm not asking you if you're moving to God. I'm asking you, do you want to walk in the Spirit today? If you do, I believe, one, you got to believe and receive, and two, you need to start every day with praise on your lips and prayer. He says here, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he says, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in your hearts. How many think, good, I don't have to do that because I can't sing? It's not what he said. He says, it's your heart. And when the Holy Spirit takes full control of your life, he's taking control of your heart, and I guarantee you, melody's coming out of you. Now, you may not want to get up and sing a solo in church, but I'll bet you you'll sing in your car. I, bet, I mean, stuff will flow out of you. you. Listen, you all, you pick up jingles all the time on commercials, don't you? Sometimes they get in your head and you can't get them out. Well, God made you that way. And he wants you from your heart to begin to sing and make melody and praise. Listen, verse 20, here it is. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's being filled with the Spirit. So you start your day praising God. It's the Spirit of God within you. I'll give you a great example that happened to me just a few weeks ago. I got up 
a Monday morning and I looked at my calendar and I realized this is a day I got to pay my property tax on my house. And I do the 50-50, how about you? And immediately I was bummed out. That's a lot of money. And I could think of a lot of things I could do with that money besides. And then I began thinking, our taxes are too high. And then I said, I'm going to protest this. You know, this is just, ah. Uh, and the Holy Spirit stopped me. And I realized I didn't even thank God for my house. I didn't thank God for the ability to pay these taxes. I didn't thank God. What a beautiful place I live in, a beautiful country I live in. Why am I not praising him instead of complaining about paying these taxes? I hear people play about, complain about income tax. You got to make money to pay income tax, folks. So it's a good thing to pay taxes because that means I'm making money. <laughs> yeah, I sell a stock. Oh, I got to pay capital gains on it. Oh, that's good. Why don't you just lose money and then you won't have to pay anything? The Holy Spirit wants us to be thankful in everything. And I believe if you want to walk in the Spirit, you must master this. When you get to this place, you're going to get up every morning and you're going to thank the Lord. You're going to be grateful. You're going to be pr- Start your day. Start your day. Like I said the other day, make it so if you wanted to be negative, you couldn't. That's the Holy Spirit. Your flesh will be negative all day long, let me tell you. Your flesh will make a list of all the bad things. But the Holy Spirit will draw a line, an X through that list, and he'll fill your heart full of praise. It's how you walk in the Spirit. Psalms 143.8. Let me hear of your unfailing love each morning. For I am trusting you. Show me where to walk. For I give myself to you. You see it? That's the work of the Holy Spirit. How many of you aren't, how many of you are morning people? And how many of you hit your snooze alarm six times before you get up? Do you do that? I'm a three. I'm up to three. But (laughs) listen, but when I get out of bed, I want to get out of bed with a spring in my step. And I'm not, that may not be your personality, but I pray the first thing on your mind will be God's loving kindness and faithfulness to you. So that when you go pay your property tax, you can do it with a smile on your face and say, God bless you all. Amen. (laughs) Let you go, what are you so happy about? Because God gave me my house. And if I didn't have this house, I wouldn't owe taxes and I'd be homeless. And I'm grateful. Amen. That's how the Holy Spirit works. You ready for number three? Boy, you got to get a hold of this one. Expect to be used every day. You see my little note there? Beware of the nudge. I'm talking about walking in the spirit now. I'm not talking about church service. I'm talking about just an everyday walk. When you get up out of bed from your first step to your second step to your third step, you're going to believe, you're going to receive. And I think it's okay every morning to say, Holy Spirit, fill me. Because that scripture we read in Ephesians when it says be filled with the spirit, it's a perfect passive participle. It means be being filled. I think it's okay to ask, Lord, just fill me up today. Stir me. Maybe that's what, stir me. Stir me up. So every part of me is affected and comes under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That's what they were talking about. Be not drunk or one. Come under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And here's what I want you to do every day. Once you've started with Thanksgiving, I want you to expect God to use you every single day. You know, we hear testimonies all the time, right? Three months ago, God did this. A year ago, God did this. And I like all that. But I want to hear testimonies. Hey, this morning, God did this. Yesterday, you won't believe what happened. I ran into this person and this happened. happened. I believe you need to get up with an expectation in your heart as a spirit-filled believer. I think you get up and say, okay, God, use me today. Proverbs 16, 9, New King James Version. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Is that true? A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Now, I'm a daytimer guy. I'm a calendar guy. I map out my day. You can ask Donna. I got it. I know what I'm going to do. But I'll tell you, more often than not, that calendar is not going to stand because God's got some other things. Now, he'll let you plan. He'll let you, he'll let you do whatever. He, he said, okay, go ahead, but wait till you see what I'm going to do, all right? You, we got to expect God to direct our steps. Go ahead. And make, you need to make plans. You don't want to get up aimlessly, but trust God in your plans. And every plan you make, you say, God, I'm committing this to you. Do whatever you want. 
Amen. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do you believe that? I believe one of the ways you acknowledge him is to say, God, I just expect you to use me today. I want you to think about this. I want you to really simplify this. Don't complicate it. I want you to believe if, if God hasn't used you yet today, today's not over. God used me today. Use me today. Maybe it's a waitress. Maybe it's a waiter. Maybe it's my neighbor. Maybe it's a grand or a child or, or my spouse. Maybe God wants to do something there through me. But I am a conduit of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit stirs up that drink in me, he's in charge. He's in charge. I remember, and some of you know this story, I, it was uh, what was in Valley Center. I was trying to get to church on a Sunday night. And I'd been at the hospital visiting, and I knew I was just barely going to make it on time if I hit all the lights just right. How many of you are praying for lights? Lights, Lord, Lord. Green, 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 green. I got to Amiton and 21st Street, and I had this uncontrollable urge for a Rocky Road ice cream cone. I thought it was the devil trying to make me late for church. And I love Rocky Road ice cream. And I mean, I could taste it. It was like, oh, I can do it. I know I can do it. I'll hurry. I'll get the ice cream. Just get a one scooper. I'm on my way. I pull up the Rocky Road. I go inside. It's packed full of people. I'm going, oh, no, the devil has trapped me. He's trapped me. Now I'm going to be late for church. And you see, when, I, when I'm after an ice cream cone, I don't see nothing but ice cream. I'm not looking at people. Ice cream, Where, do you have Rocky Road ice cream, all right? But that day was different. Because when I walked into that restaurant, in that whole sea of people, I saw two people I knew sitting at a table, and some of you know them. I had officiated their wedding years ago in the Salvation Army. I didn't know it, but they were having this conversation. I wonder where Lieutenant Voss is. I heard he's in Kansas City. It'd be nice if we could talk to him. So I, it was totally out of character for me, I left my Rocky Road ice cream and I walk over to this table and I said, how you doing guys? They look like they'd seen a ghost. <laughs> if I'd have known about their conversation, I could have had fun with it. Well, I was driving along in Kansas City and all of a sudden, pff, here I am. <laughs> wouldn't that be awesome? That'd make me a very spiritual person, wouldn't it? I said, well, I'm up here in Valley Center pastoring this church up there. You guys ought to come and join us. And they did and became a vital part of that church. So next time you have an urge for Rocky Road, it might be the Holy Spirit, all right? Just, I'm just saying, you know, don't, don't be too quick to rebuke it. You'd be amazed how God leads and directs. I heard a story the other day of a man who's a bus driver. And he was driving a bus at nighttime in a big city. And you know, sometimes, uh, I remember we took April on the bus ride, don't you, honey, in Kansas City? Remember when she, when she was little, we ride the bus. And you, you see all kinds of characters on the bus in, in the inner city. And, but this bus driver, he was driving along, and he came up to a light. And there was a car parked right next to him. And he said he had this almost uncontrollable idea, imagination, something not a voice, but the, the, hey, you're supposed to tell that man that God is still on the throne. And he said, he just rejected it because he said, I don't want to come off as a weirdo. And besides, people at night will shoot you, you know. Don't be, to be careful. But it wouldn't go away. And so he pushed the button on the door. It opened up and he goes, hey, God wants you to know he's still on the throne. And the man began to weep because he, he had just said, sitting in his car in a deep, dark place, God, are you still on the throne? And a bus driver came and declared that he was. Is that not just the coolest thing? You got to walk in the spirit if you're going to do something. Like, could God do something like that? I think he could. I remember, 
I know we get, we're running out of time here, but I, I remember when we were in a building program in the Salvation Army, and this, does, this isn't a lot of money today, but back then it was. We needed $400,000 to build this building. It's right across from Dodd School, if you ever go over there. And uh, so we had, see, the plans of man come from the heart of man. We had this plan. And we stayed up almost all night one night addressing envelopes, writing out letters that we were going to send to strategic people asking them to help us. And we were going to pray over these letters and God was going to move and it was going to be awesome. But we went to our advisory board meeting that day and Bob Dry was there. He used to own Shepler's. Remember Shepler's? And uh, Mrs. Wiederman, Olive Ann Beach, they were all there at this meeting. And I was seeking their permission and blessing to send out these letters because I knew they'd be proud of me because I'd worked so hard and the plan was in motion. It was great. And then one, I can't remember which one it was, said, well, well, Lieutenant, would it be okay if we gave? We'd like to give too. I said, no, no, I didn't say that. I said, sure, sure. I couldn't believe what happened next. They all started writing out checks. I couldn't wait to get home and tell Connie, I walked out of that lunch with $410,000. God will let, I said, God, why didn't you tell me so I didn't stay up all night writing those stupid letters? Because I want to teach you how to walk in the spirit. Go ahead and make your plans. But trust me that I'm going to direct your steps. And sometimes the little things, somebody you... Listen to people when they're talking and you're in a restaurant. God may set up a divine appointment for you. I heard somebody call them divine intersections that you have. You probably have them all the time. You don't even know about it. You know why I know that? Because you're full of the Holy Spirit. That's why. And he, that is his heart. We read it earlier. Abba Father. He's into relationships. He wants to work through you. I guarantee you. But you need to just expect it. Get ready for that Holy Spirit nudge. All right? Can I tell you one more story before we come to the table? And some of you know the story well, but it was a life changer for me. And it involved the insurance world. And again, uh, this is when uh, Marsha worked for us. And we had a client, and she was uh, mean. She was mean. Do you have any mean people in your life? You know, they're just always unhappy and upset. And they say things sometimes that are hurtful. You know those people, don't you? When you see them on your phone, you're not going to pick up, are you? You're going to let them leave a voicemail because you don't have time to mess with that stuff. It's that kind of person. And one day this person came in and told my secretary that she was incompetent. That'll make your day. And I, t I told Marsha, Marsha, you're not incompetent. You're wonderful. You're great. You know? But it hurt her. It made her cry. And she said to me, Joe, if you want her as a client, then you got to work with her from now on. I want nothing to do with her. So it's up to you. I said, well, I want her as a client, so I'll work, I'll work with her. And I remember one day she came into the office, and she was, came upstairs, and she was mean, said some hurtful things even to me, and we got all done with our business, and, and I, I think it was a Holy Spirit nudge because it didn't make any sense. But out of my mouth came these words. What's the worst thing that's ever happened to you in your whole life? She didn't hesitate, not even a second. And she said, oh, I'll tell you, I was 18 years old and I was raped and shot and left in an alley for dead. And I went, qualifies, that qualifies as the worst possible day ever. But it hit me at that moment now I know why this lady's so mean, because she's wounded and hurt. And so I asked her, I said, listen, would it be okay if I pray with you? You know, I find 99% of people will let you pray with them. So let the Holy Spirit pray through you. You don't even have to think of, I don't know what to pray. Open your mouth. Let the Holy Spirit pray. You may pray with strange things that you think, I don't know, this probably doesn't make much sense. But I prayed over her life, and, and she, let me tell you, she, the floodgates opened up, and she told me everything about her life, more than I wanted to know. And I was like, whoa. So after she left, a few days later, uh, I sent her a little handwritten card. 
And, and I said, hey, I just want you to know, I appreciate you opening up the other day. You're more than a client. I just want you to know. And I said, I love you. I love you. And God loves you. Because one day somebody said that to me. Even after I spit on him, Joe, I love you and God loves you. Stop it. Stop it. It's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, use the name of Jesus. It's powerful. Just, I said, I love you and, you're, and, and I just want you to know I'm going to be praying for you. Two weeks passed and the intercom went off on the phone and Harsha said, oh, it's, and she's mad. I said, really? Yeah, she's really mad. She's coming up the stairs right now. And she was not a little woman. She came into my office. I was hyperventilating because I thought she was going to hit me. And I was thinking in my mind, I was racing. You know, I've never hit a woman in my life, but how am I going to defend myself? Because it wouldn't look good to go home. A, a woman beat me up today, honey. She comes around my desk. I was ready. I thought, Phew. she grabbed me pulled me up out of my chair with tears in her eyes and hugged me and said, no one has ever sent me a card and told me they loved me. And then she dropped me like a sack of potatoes in my chair. I think that's where my heart thing came from. I think that was it that day. To this day, this lady lives in Colorado she still emails me, and guess how she begins the letter every time? To my friend Joe. I'd like to tell you, oh, this lady, everything's turned out wonderful for her. No, it hasn't. But I'm still connected because, see, all I do is show up. It's the Holy Spirit, and sometimes there's going to be things that happen, and There'll be think, times God's using you, you don't even know about it. I want to close with this scripture, Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Wait a minute, I thought he was the light of the world. No, he is. But I am a reflection of that light, right? Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. A basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. How are you going to do that? You're going to do it by walking in the Spirit. So would you commit to me? We're going to come to this table as we close this service today. What is this table? This is the table of life. What this represents is my my own personal relationship with Christ. I put my trust in him. I believed in him and I received his gift as my personal savior. But now he's calling me to walk in the spirit. So I want you to come back to this table. Those of you who are sons and daughters of the living God, I want you to come and take this cup and bread this morning. I want you to thank him for your salvation. But then I want you to pray, Lord, fill me with the spirit and let me walk in the spirit I expect you to use me in my life and just start that journey. And we're going to be unpacking a lot of things this summer. We're going to be talking about a lot of stuff, stuff that may make you uncomfortable. But I'll tell you what, when you enter into this, you will have no regrets, no complaints, because God wants to use you. And you're thinking God wants to use everybody else. No, God wants to use you. Oh, God's going to use Pastor Joe. Oh, he's got the coolest stories. No, God wants to use you because you are full of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus was emphatic. Guys, I got to go and it's going to be for your benefit. And yes, I'm going to die. I'm, my blood is going to be shed for your sins. You're going to be forgiven. You're going to be redeemed. And then I'm going to, I'm going to raise from the dead and you're going to raise from the dead. And I'm going to be the first fruits. But you're going to walk in the Spirit because I'm going to fill you with the Spirit and you're going to be my ambassadors wherever you go. Amen. Are you, are you, would you be willing to start first step would you believe and receive? Would you believe and receive? Are you this? Would you like to be this? I believe God wants to stir that up today. Amen? And I'm going to pray with you at the end of the service. You're going to be dismissed. I'll stick around as long as necessary. You say, well, do you lay hands on people? How's that work? You know, well, it can be, yeah, yeah. There are times nobody touched anybody. There's times when they laid hands on. I just, I think what God's looking for from you is an open heart and a fresh look and saying, God, 
I want to give myself to you. Stir me up today. Amen? Amen? So we, we come to this table. We reflect on our text again. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Can we, can we take that step today? Father, we come to this table. It is the table of life. We receive the bread and the, and the cup, and we know it represents our own salvation. And now you have placed us in the middle of, of the season of Pentecost. The harvest time is upon us. We are sons and daughters, but Lord, would you help us walk in the spirit every day of our lives. Stir us up today. Make it fresh and new in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We invite you to come down the center aisle, make your way to the side table, take the cup and bread, return to your seat, and we'll receive it together. God bless you as you come. Spirit of Jesus, living within us, never to fail or forsake, an unending promise, heaven inside us, whispers the sound. Father, we thank you for the, the Passover lamb, the perfect lamb of God that came to take away our sins. We stand forgiven today. But now, Lord, we're here in this season, this time of Pentecost, the time of harvest. Lord, we want to thank you. We want to remember this precious gift. And now we pray as we take this that you would stir up within us the Holy Spirit. It is your gift to us. We don't get it by the law. We don't get it by works. We get it because we believe and receive. And today as we take this cup and bread, may this be a time to believe and to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. stand with me please as we prepare to leave this place remember our last slide remember what season you're in remember remember your salvation but remember you weren't just saved from something you were saved for something and I'm praying this week, just, just this week, don't think beyond this week, okay? Would you join with me in believing and receiving, starting your day with thanksgiving and prayer? And would you join me every day expecting God to use you, looking for the Holy Spirit nudge or whatever that might be? And then I'd like you to report back and tell me what God is doing through your life. There's nothing more exciting. You need, you need to 
a fresh start in your life, you, you need things to be kicked up a notch, just start letting God use you. You see, you're too focused on yourself. Start letting God use you, and you'll be amazed how your problems will dissipate as God begins to use you in powerful ways. Amen? Amen? I want you to be supernaturally natural and naturally supernatural. That's what we're committing to today. Can I pray with you? And when I'm through praying, I'm going to stay here. I want to pray with you. I'd love to lay hands on you. I'd love to just pray with you. And let, just, I'd love to see God stir up in you something fresh and new today. If you have any kind of needs, we'd love to pray with you. We're not in any hurry to get out of here. I know you got places to go, but we'll stay. And be patient if you're willing to come. Maybe sit on the front row if we're praying. Just wait. It could be worth your time because maybe the Holy Spirit's wanting to do something special in you today. Are you ready to go? I just see you like a rocket ship on a launching pad. The engines are firing. We're getting ready to take off. The Holy Spirit's going to put you in orbit. And then watch what happens after that. Amen. Father, I thank you for this congregation. I pray your blessings upon us. Lord, there's so much we, have, we want to learn during this summertime as we understand what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives and what potential lays before us. Lord, I'm so grateful that I don't have to do this in my own strength. I'm so grateful that this is by the power of the Holy Spirit in me. This is a game changer. Help me to walk in it more. Even in these late years, I wanna know it in greater measure. And I pray that over those I love the most. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Go in God's love, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit.